Researchers say it's highly likely that most of the fuel inside the crippled number two reactor at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant has melted. Fuel in three of the plant's six reactors melted down in the March 2011 disaster. Officials with the plant's operator, Tokyo Electric Power Company, thought some of the fuel in the number two reactor still remained inside the core. But researchers from Nagoya University have come to a different conclusion. They've been probing the reactor since April of last year, using a device that emits elementary particles called muons. It allows them to take X-ray-like photos of the plant. They say the results show few signs of nuclear fuel left in the core. That's in contrast to the number five reactor, where fuel is clearly visible. The finding has led them to conclude that 70 to 100 percent of the fuel inside the number two reactor has likely melted. The finding has led them to conclude that 70 to 100 percent of the fuel inside the number two reactor has likely melted. They say they'll conduct further tests to determine whether it leaked any further. Knowing what's happening inside the reactor will have a significant impact on the process of the decommissioning work. A previous probe conducted by a different institute had revealed that no nuclear fuel remains in the number one reactor and that it had penetrated the core's base. Officials with the Japanese government and TEPCO say they plan to conduct further tests using a different device. They're also preparing to use remote-controlled robots around the number two reactor. The research group will announce the results of its study on Saturday at a meeting of the Physical Society of Japan in Osaka. Do you know personally of any scientists or engineers that are in the process of developing new technology, robots or otherwise, to deal with Fukushima? And does any of it seem hopeful or promising to you? Right, okay. Um, uh, no is the answer to that. Uh, I, I think that, um, that all of the work that had been done with robots to try and sort out Chernobyl showed that it's impossible to use uh, robots because the problem is that the electronic systems that robots work on cannot sustain, um, uh, they cannot function when the radiation fields get too high. Because the radio see, when radiation impinges on, 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 on a substance, on, on a, an immaterial, what it does is it creates electrons. That's why it's called ionizing radiation. It ion, it, it, it's absorbed by the material, and it ionizes the material, which means that it kicks electrons out of the material. Now, the problem is that robots work on electrons. Your computer works on electrons. All of these chips, all of the, all the electronic chips that, that, that you, people use, are all, uh, are all work on electrons, I and mean, you can't have a system where the electrons are just randomly being kicked out all over the place because, you know, ultimately the, the whole thing gets scrambled, and that's what they found in in, in um, Chernobyl. And they had a, they had a, they had they tried everything. They tried the uh, German, Germans had some very fancy robots, and then they tried uh, robots from somewhere else, and they built their own robots, and none of the robots worked. They worked up to the point where they got into the high radiation fields, and then they just went mad, went around in circles, and sort of fell off the side. That's why, in the end, in Chernobyl, they had to send men in. They called them bio robots, and they just they just pulled up 20,000 men from the reserve army list. And they, they, they put roofing lead around them and, and sent them in to pick up this stuff by their bare hands and throw it, throw it over the side. And, of course, they all died. Uh, you won't hear that. I mean, the international nuclear industry says that, says that nobody really died after Chernobyl except a few of the firemen right at the beginning. But there, there's an enormous number of, of uh, people who died because the Russians sent in these, these young men. And the young men just got huge radiation effects, and then they died, oh, mostly died before they were 40. Terrifying. But this can't happen in Japan, and the robots won't work. So as I say, there's nothing you can do. They just have to dig around it, isolate it, put up a big notice saying, mankind's folly, and, and keep it cool for, you know, for another thousand years or however long it is. Um, all right. Brains. Brains, brains, and more brains. You guys ready for this? Mm -hmm. Sorry. Okay, well, you say there's no solution to the waste, but there is a solution to the waste, and the solution to the waste is to just leave it exactly where it is and to have somebody look at it for, for a million years, you know. So, so they just have to have all these zombies who are there at the moment sitting there doing nothing who are going to just have to sit there and their children are going to sit there and their children's children and so on. 
looking at the waste and making sure that it doesn't leak out of the tanks and if it starts to look like it's going to leak out of the tanks they build another tank around that tank and then they build another tank around the tank that they built around that tank and so on you know to infinity and that is a solution to the waste because then the waste will just stay where it is now and it won't get any worse and if they make more waste they'll have to put it inside that tank and leave it there and as far as contaminated land is concerned, and places like Sellafield and all that, they'll just have to put a fence around it and say, this is contaminated land, do not enter. And so that's the best we can do. I mean, it doesn't help to put it down a hole in the ground. I mean, you may as well put it somewhere where you can keep an eye on it and make sure it doesn't escape. So that's the solution. And why not put a hole in the ground? Ah, well, because then if something goes wrong, you can't do anything about it. That's the point. And what could be could go wrong there. Oh, God, well, loads of things could go wrong. I mean, the main thing that would go wrong is that it go, it's, it's a hole in, in the ground is not a secured depository, you know? I mean, you put it into a hole in the ground and then there's a crack in the hole in the ground or maybe there's a, an earthquake or, or maybe there's a fault that you didn't know about or maybe there's some water movement that, that changes over a period of time and we're talking geological time scale, so, you know, just about everywhere where they've suggested putting it in a hole in the ground has had a geological um, fault occurring, you know, uh, 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 in, in the last thousand years, never mind about, you know, the next million years or whatever it is it has for the half-life of these uraniums and plutoniums. So you can't, you can't actually guarantee that if you put it in a hole in the ground, something won't go wrong. And you can't pull it out of the hole in the ground, that's the point. I mean, the, the, the force mark idea is not one in which they put it down in the hole in the ground and then they can take it out if something goes wrong. They can't. They just pop it down and pop the next one down and pop the next one down and so on and send it all down there and then they seal it all up. But if something goes wrong, then they can't do anything. Whereas if it's where it is at the moment, at Sellafield or wherever it is, above ground or in some kind of big hangar or big kind of area where they kind of look at it, then they can look at it. And if something goes wrong and they've got all their detectors and their Geiger counters and whatnot, then they can just repackage it and put something around it. But they have to sit there. Yeah, they have to sit there forever. Absolutely, yeah, sure. Well, it serves them right, isn't it? They shouldn't have made it in the first place. And I've no doubt they'll pay them a lot of money for sitting there. <laughs> so, yeah, they can sit there. And, and, I mean, maybe they should have special uniforms, like, you know, guard of the nuclear waste, and they could have, like, special kind of green uniforms with special badges, like Superman or something, you know. They make them feel good. <laughs> I've always thought it quite good to have special uniforms. In all the science fiction stories, they did special uniforms, you know. So you could say, what's your daddy do? Oh, he's a god of the nuclear waste. Oh, no. <laughs> what a useful job, George. Yes, it is, isn't it? Here's a Strontium 90 Milks update. Fukushima dairy farmers to restart shipments. Fukushima... Dairy farmers who were forced to suspend business following the 2011 nuclear incident at Tokyo Electric Power Company's Fukushima No. 1 power plant to restart milk shipments as early as this year. With a new large-scale stock farm completed in the city of Fukushima on Friday. Are these people freaking crazy? After Chernobyl, there's still huge zones where they will not have cattle grazed on any of that Chernobyl grass. These insane people in charge in Fukushima, they're just trying to defy reality. It's really sad and heartbreaking because this Fukushima milk is going to be on the market now. The fully supported by the government and the Prefectural Dairy Cooperative Association, the stock farm with 580 cows is expected to become a foothold for rebuilding the prefecture dairy industry, hit hard by business closures and radiation related rumors. Well, if all these rumors are there and you have your cows there, that's not helping the issue. The farm is operated by a company established jointly by five dairy farmers. The company aims to produce 5,000 tons of raw milk annually under a computer-based control system on the 3.6, 8.9 acre farm. Again, can't they find 8.9 acres somewhere else in Japan besides Fukushima to have a dairy farm? Why are they so obsessed with growing products and produce in Fukushima? It's disgusting. This is not helping the rumors apparently they don't like. They should have this in Okinawa or somewhere far from Fukushima. 
I have chosen to do this because a sense of responsibility for the rebuilding of the dairy industry, Fukushima Tanaka said, at a completion ceremony. It will be the happiest thing to cheer up our peers by our stock farm getting on a growth path. What, a growth path of tumors? Following the triple meltdown at the nuclear plant triggered by the massive earthquake and tsunami in March of 2011, 76 dairy farmers had to evacuate and suspend their operations. Among them, only 13 farmers have restarted their business. In the prefecture, annual production of raw milk remains sluggish at around 80,000 tons. 80,000 tons are still being produced in Fukushima? Jeez. So it's only down 20% since the disaster. Uh, it's not enough. It really should be 100%. There should be no milk coming out from Fukushima. And this is strontium-90. This is leukemia. This is seals. We've seen the seals dying with leukemia at the San Francisco. They found these seals that have leukemia. And leukemia comes from strontium-90 that's settled in the bones. There should be no milk coming out of Fukushima. And now we're hearing here there's 80,000 tons. And it's only down 20% since Fukushima. I mean, this did not happen in Russia. Uh, the Russians... I hate to say it, but the Russians, they care more about their citizens than the Japanese. They did. They have a longer exclusion zone that still remains to this day in Chernobyl. Um, the Russians abandoned hundreds of towns away from, from Chernobyl. This is just disgusting, really. And this, this new milk farm here is being subsidized by the government. They only care about perception, that it's safe when it's really not.